about loading and laying, I suppose you're all feeling set to have a crack at something. But you won't score many hits unless the gun is as ready as you are. So let's have a quick run through the day preparation for action on the gun. Look out for your own particular job. Twice a day, once after sunrise, once before sunset, the duty watch must check and test to ensure that all parts of the gun are ready for immediate use. Each number has a separate job. Each job is equally important. The line layer tests the gears of his sight, traversing the piece both ways to satisfy himself it's working freely. It should be remembered that when testing gears, the gun should be moved right through the arc of fire for which it's set up. The elevation layer tests his elevating gears in a similar way, moving the piece in both directions. If necessary, the layers oil the gears to get complete freedom of movement. The oil can for this will be found in the tray of stores belonging to the gun. It is the duty of number two to see that these stores are always ready for use. The sight setter, meanwhile, tests his head and breast telephone set with the clock operator in the BOP. The circuit is checked both ways and satisfactory communication between them is established. He then tests his range dial to its full extent and checks that he can apply both left and right deflections. Number one inspects the recoil and run out after first depressing the gun. After unscrewing the air plug in the tank, he unscrews the air plug in the buffer cylinder. And if no oil appears, he takes out the filling plug so that he can top up the oil level in the tank with buffer oil. The tools for this are in the tray of stores on the gun floor. He measures the quantity of oil in the cylinder to find out how much replacement oil is required. Then, using the buffer oil measure, he pours in the exact quantity necessary to bring the buffer up to its full efficiency once more. As soon as oil appears at the air plug, both screws should be tightened up and all traces of oil wiped away. The importance of this inspection of the recoil cannot be overemphasized. After these preliminary tests and inspections, all communications between the gun and the BOP must be checked. Test telephone. Number one, report. Number one, correct. True. Correct. Number two, report. Number two, correct. True. Correct. Test loud speakers. Number one, report. Number one, correct. Correct. Number two, report. Number two, correct. Correct. Test signal indicators. Number one, test. Correct. Correct. Number two, test. Correct. Correct. Back on the gun, one of the most important tests which number one personally carries out is the testing of the protrusion of the striker. He applies the striker protrusion gauge to the point of the firing pin and checks it within the limits of the gauge. Number two then reassembles the breech mechanism after having carefully carried out an examination lubricating if necessary. He then cleans the vent axial with the vent bit. The sight setter, meanwhile, prepares for testing the sights. First, by slackening off the fixing screws, he moves the charge temperature and muzzle velocity strips to the normal position and screws down firmly. This is most important, and although only a small adjustment, it should not be forgotten. Then he sets his range dial and deflecting scale at zero. Sights must now be tested for both line and elevation. To make this test, cross wires must be placed over the muzzle of the gun. 
There are grooved markings on the muzzle for accurate placing of the wires, which should be straight and securely fixed. All scales have, of course, been set at zero, remember? A well-defined object is selected as far distant as possible and with a good clean vertical and horizontal line. Number one supervises the testing himself, laying the gun by means of the vent and the muzzle crosswires, like this. The elevation layers telescope should now be laid on the object. If it's out for line, the sight setter brings it on by means of the deflection dial, while the layer looks through the telescope, signalling when he's on. The deflection dial is then brought back to zero by slackening off the three clamping screws and slipping the plate. The elevation layers telescope has now been adjusted to lay accurately for line with the deflection dial reading zero. The line layers telescope should also now be laid on the object. If it's out, it must be brought on by adjusting the cross connecting shaft. This is done by the side setter releasing the locking nut on the left hand side and the number one unscrewing the nut on the right. The number one then turns the shaft. This has the effect of moving the telescope laterally and bringing the line layer accurately on for line without moving the gun or the elevation layers telescope at all. Number one then looks through to check the lay and satisfy himself that all is correct. Right, both telescopes are now laid to agree with the vertical line of the muzzle crosswire. OK, but that's only half the job. The sights must next be checked for elevation. We'll take the elevation layers telescope first. If it's out, the locking screw on the front of the telescope must be slackened off and an adjustment made to bring the telescope on. To do this, the number one unscrews the plate and with the special spanner provided, adjusts the nut and bush on the bracket till the elevation layer signals that he's back on the target. His horizontal crosswire has now been brought onto the shoulder of the lighthouse, though the gun has not been moved. Similarly, the line layers telescope must be checked for elevation in exactly the same manner. The plate is removed and the adjustment made with the special spanner until the layer signals on. This detail of adjusting the sights may not be identical for all mountings, but the principle remains the same. The thing to remember is that both sights must be tested for line and elevation. Only thus can you be sure that the axis of the bore of the gun and both the layer's telescopes are all exactly in line and ready for accurate laying at the new zero. The muzzle velocity and charge temperature of the moment are then reset by readjusting the strips. With all tests completed, number one satisfies himself that everyone has finished and then collects reports from each. That's one. Ton. Report. Two. Correct. Three. Correct. Four. Correct. Five. Correct. Six. Correct. Line layer. Correct. Elevation layer. Correct. Side setter. Correct. That's one. Spear. The LP answering. Through. Number two, ready to load, sir. Go. When the number one on the gun has reported, the officer of the watch leaves the BOP and goes down to the gun to make a thorough inspection. That one. Ha! I will inspect number two. Layers two and sight setter, take post. The officer himself must check that all is as it should be, for he is responsible for the thoroughness with which the tests have been carried out in preparing the gun for action. He examines the recoil system for buffer and gland leakage and makes sure that the running out rods are secure. If these come off, it'll cost you more than seven and six a week. He then examines the chamber and breech to make sure that they're clean and that there are no burrs on the threads of the breech screw. He must also satisfy himself that the breech has been lubricated. Next, in order to make the obturation test, he orders number two to put tallow around the cone seating in the chamber. If tallow is not available, chalk may be used instead. The breech is then closed and opened again. And the officer of the watch makes a careful examination of the obturator pad. 
Notice that he looks underneath as well as on top to ensure that the whole surface of the pad is covered with tallow, thus indicating that the pad is correctly fitted. Before examining the layer's telescopes, he first checks that the muzzle cross wires are laid by looking through the vent. He sees that all scales are at zero, and then he looks through each telescope in turn and checks that the sights agree. During his inspection, the officer of the watch ascertains by question and answer that each man understands his duties. He also satisfies himself that the gun and equipment are ready for immediate use. Much of this may seem to you to be unimportant, but that's your very big mistake. It's the detail which is important. Nothing must be left to chance if you're going to get results. So ends preparation for action on the gun. Meanwhile, preparation for action is continuing in the BOP. The clock operator carries out his tests. There are two of them, the rate test and the speed test. For the rate test, he starts the clock and sets the rate pointer to zero. The clock dial should remain stationary under its hairline. It does. It's truth. Now for the speed test. For this, the clock operator uses a stopwatch with which he times the speed of movement of the range dial. He sets rate opening 2000 and times the movement of the range dial over 4000 yards. This should take exactly two minutes. He then repeats the same test with rate closing 2000. If the dial is incorrect, the operator can adjust it by means of the regulator lever. This regulator is under the cover plate on the side of the clock and by its use fine adjustments can be made to the speed of the mechanism. After regulating, the operator must repeat the test and continue to regulate until the correct speed is obtained. The bar and Stroud detachment also test their instrument. There's a separate film about this. You want to see it sometime. And the NCO in charge, when he's collected reports and has satisfied himself that the instrument is in adjustment, reports, bar and Stroud ready for action. Eh? Stand by to test alarm circuit. Ring the alarm circuit for that, please. Number one, alarm circuit correct. Number two, alarm circuit correct. Two. BOP, ready for action, sir. Charge temperature 62. Charge temperature 62. Number one, through. Number two, through. Post lookout, remainder to the watch shelters, dismiss. Check lookout bearing and range. Lookout bearing 270 degrees. Lookout range 5,000. Lookout bearing 270 degrees. Lookout range 5,000. Number one through. Number two through. Post lookout remainder to the watch shelters dismiss. Post lookout remainder to the watch shelter dismiss. Number one through. Number two through. Eleventh lookout take post remainder falling outside. B battery ready for action. After posting the gun lookout, the number one doubles the detachment to the watch shelters, where they stand by in readiness for instant action. And with the coming of darkness, another watch prepares to take over. Their duties begin with a manning parade held by the officer of the watch. Manning Parade. The senior NCO falls in the watch.
Bill Fay, attachment. Each number one independently inspects his own detachment. The officer of the watch now takes over the parade. Battery, turn! Tell off! Report, POP staff. Present and correct. Number one. Present and correct. Number two. Present and correct. Machine gun detail. Present and correct. Battery, stand east. The tactical situation is... The Navy Here, the officer of the watch can read out either battery standing orders and the tactical situation, or the tactical situation only. Always finishing with... Are there any questions? Battery, turn. Prepare for action. The old watch, meanwhile, have been preparing to hand over. They come out from the watch shelters and pile their equipment in readiness. Before they go, they must sweep and clean up, each watch being responsible for handing over the shelter in good order. The old watch wait outside for the arrival of the new one. Here they come at the double from the manning parade with full kit and equipment. And they fall in at the side of the old watch they are leaving, while the two numbers one go down to inspect the shelter. Number one of the old watch formally hands over the shelter and its equipment to the number one of the new. Then back to their detachments. Next, the old watch returns to the gun, while the new watch falls out to the shelter to get rid of its kit. In this way, while the new watch gets ready to take over, there's always a detachment ready to man the gun. In the shelter, the detachment take off their greatcoats and at once start to change into their gun floor shoes. Rifles are stacked and the men prepare to make themselves comfortable during their spell of duty. For this is where they spend most of their time during the watch. When changing into gun floor shoes, the trousers must be folded and tucked inside the socks to allow complete freedom of movement. In action, speed is essential. You don't want to go tripping around the place with a hundred pound shell. As soon as they're dressed, the new watch leave the shelter and take over on the gun. Right, turn. A new lookout is immediately posted, and the old lookout remains with him during the handover, until his right, eyes are accustomed to the darkness. The new watch takes post, and the number one of the old watch formally hands over the gun, and its stores and equipment, right, to his opposite turn. number in the new. Then comes a brief night preparation for action. The breech mechanism is tested and its working parts lubricated if necessary. The elevation layer checks the focus of his telescope. Every layer should know his focus number and be able to set it without looking through the telescope. He also tests his elevating gears, depressing and elevating the gun to satisfy himself that he hasn't bought a pup. The line layer also sets his telescope to the known focus number and checks his traversing gear, moving the gun in both directions to cover the whole arc of fire. Remembering, of course, to bring it back to the lookout bearing when he's finished. All communications, telephones, signal lights, loudspeaker, have to be tested to ensure the control of the gun in action from the BOP. The old watch, meanwhile, return to collect their kit and equipment from outside the shelter. Their spell of duty is over. All that remains is their manning parade, and then home for a spot of bed. Meanwhile, up in the BOP... You're here at last. Yes, old boy. That's any supper for me? Well, yes, just a little, but it's cold, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, if you're ready, you'll hand over the yes, rest what's away. doing? Well, here we are, all in the book of words. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new except for six fishing boats coming in about dawn. Right here. Otherwise... Yes, right, right here. Well, cheer, old chap. Don't be late in the morning. <laughs> we'll see about that. Good night. Oh, in the shelters, the detachment can occupy themselves as they wish, so long as they keep awake and ready for any emergency. 
Nah, I like them to wobble when I smack them. They must be prepared for immediate action at any time. The duty lookouts must be on constant alert for any enemy craft which may show up. Night is the most likely time for an attack. Complete concentration is necessary for this job, and a relief must be provided every hour, the old lookout remaining at his post until the new one's eyes are accustomed to the dark. And that's the story of the six-inch naval. It's a good gun, an accurate gun, and a gun that's worth serving. The Navy gave it to us in our hour of need. Let's carry on the good work.